The title of the message this morning is this, very simply, Subject to Change. We're in Philippians chapter number 2, and we're looking at verses 14 through 16. We go verse by verse here at Heritage, next chapter, next verse, what does the Bible say? And we've been in Philippians now for several months, and we're just walking through these next few verses. And the Bible says this in verse number 14, it says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Some of you, I just lost you right there. Some of you say, I don't believe the Bible. I believe, I, I, I believe all the Bible except for that verse right there. Let me read it again. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Verse 15 says that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Can we take a little poll here this morning? How many in this room you enjoy and like change? How many like change? All right, okay, wonderful. These are, these are some interesting people over here, right, that like change, right? Let me try that again. Maybe you missed that question. Just in case you missed it, let me try it again. How many of you just love, I mean, tell you what, I mean, for you, a perfect day is when you wake up and everything that you thought was going to happen and all your routines absolutely change and everything is not in any way like you planned. How many love that? Okay, all right, we still have a couple more, all right? A few more, all right? Absolutely. That light change. Listen, we don't like change. It's just a natural fact. I think it's human nature. I think we're kind of born with that fact that we like things the way we are. And some of us are more like that than others. Some of you are okay with change. Some of you can deal with change, but some of you do not like change. And the best of you comes out when things start to change, right? You don't like change. But can I say this this morning as we jump into this, this uh, scripture and we learn what God is teaching us? You have to understand this, that growth leads to change. Growth leads to change. And as we look into the Bible, we have to understand what God is trying to do in our life. As we grow, things will change. You may not like change. You may not want change. But if you desire to grow in your life, if you want to experience any level of growth, then you have to be willing to embrace some level of change because growth and change are connected. They are absolutely connected. And we see this in Philippians chapter number two. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we have been walking through growing together. Matter of fact, in our uh, Vision Sunday that we had back in January, we talked about what is the vision for our church in 2022. And we talked about growth, that we would grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But not just growing our church. Listen, God grows the church, and we trust him for how he's going to grow. But I believe that God in this year wants to grow you. He wants to grow your family. He wants to grow your marriage. He wants to grow your relationships with your children. He wants to grow at you as a Christian. And so we talked about in our Vision Sunday about we need as, as individual Christians to grow healthier. We need healthier levels of growth. We need to grow deeper into God's word and understand how God wants us to live. And then we can grow stronger as a church and as individual Christians. And so the last few messages in Philippians have been centered around this idea of growth. And I want to share with you the process of Christian growth. There is a process that we have been kind of walking through the last couple of weeks we talked two weeks ago about the phrase, work out your own salvation, Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 12. If you would missed the message, you can watch it on YouTube and, and catch up on that. But let me catch up real quick. We talked about the idea that God is calling us because of who Jesus is. Remember the, remember the word, therefore, therefore, because Jesus Christ is all powerful and every knee will bow. Therefore, we can begin to grow in his power, not in our own strength, not in our own ability, but in his power alone. Alone. So Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And so the process of Christian growth is it starts with obeying God. Whatever God says to do, I'm going to do it, not because I have the, the will and the desire to do it, but because of who Jesus is. I'm going to grow through his power and strength. So we see that God wants us to, to, to obey. This is the process of Christian growth. Then last week, we talked about trust. And I use that word because trust is an important word because what happens is when we grow, when we begin to work out our own salvation, God leads us to a place where he's trying to position us. 
And we talked last week about fighting against God. Remember the, I had Logan up here with the box, and I was telling him to hold the box and put him in a position, and, and he was almost falling over, but I came and I you know, held him up, you know, and held him in my hands, right? What God does sometimes is this. We say, okay, God, I'm going to obey. That's a great thing. You, after this service, you may say, you know what? He said that, and I'm going to obey. Can I give you some great news? That if you decide to obey God, God may lead you into some really awkward and tough positions. Yes. Right? And in those awkward and tough positions, we have to trust God. It says in Philippians 2.13, it says, For it is God who works in you. I have to trust that however I'm being positioned is because God is trying to work in my life. Why? Because he's trying to help me obey him. Obeying Christ and following the Bible is not always the easiest thing uh, in your life. And so God has to strengthen you and has to position you so you'll trust him. So that was the last two weeks. And then we also talked about, we talked about growth. So the process of Christian growth is very simply, is that we obey, we trust, and then we grow. Philippians 2.13, the rest of the verse says, to will and to work for his good pleasure. Okay, let's put it all together here. So God says, I want you to work out your own salvation. I want you to obey me. When you obey me, I'm going to put you in some awkward positions because I'm working in your life and I may put you in a place that you don't understand but you have to trust me and then when you trust me what will happen is I will perform my will and I will do my good pleasure which means you will grow okay this is the process of Christian growth so let me let me kind of back it up a little rewind a little bit so we understand it's got to get this so we can get to the rest of the message so I obey right so okay let's say for example let's use any any illustration I'm going to be nicer to my wife. That's a good one, right? Okay. The Bible says husbands love your wives. All right. All right. So the guy gets up one Sunday and he preaches about loving your wife. And I'm like, you know what? I need to not get upset when, when I come home and dinner's not on the table and my slippers are not next to the easy chair and I, I shouldn't have expectations. I'm going to love my wife more. And so what you do is instead of, you know, getting upset in your heart about the fact that things aren't the way you want, you try to be nice. And then all of a sudden your wife does something that annoys you even more than the other thing that she used to do. And God is saying, God is saying, hey, trying to grow you, right? We do offer marriage counseling here. If anybody needs it afterwards, let me know. And so what God does is you thought, okay, God, I'm going to obey you. But then now I wasn't expecting this. And God says, ah, no, no. Because see, when you obey, you got to trust me that I'm going to position you. Do you really want to obey? I'm going to do something in your life. And let's see how serious you are about obeying. He puts you in this position where you have to respond to your wife in a way that you never thought before. But because you want to obey him by loving your wife, then you say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. And then when you trust God and you see that God works in that situation and it was better to be nice than to get angry all of a sudden you go wow maybe God's way does work and what happens is when you realize that you know what that's called it's called growth it's called growth now here's the really fun part when you follow the process of Christian growth you start out with obedience you start out with trust you end up with growth but then there's one more there's one more because if you are going to obey God and trust him and allow God to grow you, you know what's going to come into your life? I, I put it up on the screen very subtly here. Go ahead and put it up, Larry. It's going to be change. Change. Now, let's, take, let, let's, let's, let's ask that question again. How many of you in this room, you love change? Right? And, and so what happens is, is that as God works in our life, He's leading us to a place of change in our life as Christians. And if we naturally resist change and resist things getting messed up the way that we like it, then what's going to happen is we're going to push back when God wants to work in our life. God is calling some of you to obey and to trust him and to grow. But that means he's leading you to a place where you're going to have to ch change. And we see the regular, go to the next slide there. We see the, the final process here. So the process of Christian growth, I obey, I trust, I grow, I change. This is literally how Christianity works. I obey God. I trust him whatever situation he puts me in. I grow because I trust him. And then something changes in my life. Take any situation that you're in, that you face, no matter what it is, you obey God, you trust him, you grow, you change. 
You obey God, you trust him, you grow, and you change. And what Paul is saying here in, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, he's talking about the change part. He's going to bring to light some things that will change when you grow. Things that will change when you grow. Now, because we preach the Bible verse by verse and we want to understand the Bible, this passage here, I can say, hey, trust God, let him change you. But you don't make the changes. And I have to take a moment to pull aside for you to understand this. Paul is not telling people, hey, you should change how you live. He's not telling him that. He's not telling them that. He's not saying, hey, you know what? You know what you're doing is wrong. You need to change that. Right? I saw one time a skit on YouTube, and the guy went for counseling. The lady went for counseling, and she said, uh, she said, you know, sir, I'm dealing with this, and I'm, I'm going through this difficulty. And it was a fun, it was a kind of a spoof. And, and the response of the counselor was, well, stop it. <laughs> right? She said, you know, I'm, I'm really dealing. My husband and I are having some, some tough things. I yell at him sometimes, and. She, he goes, well, stop doing that. And I think that's how we approach Christianity sometimes. We think, okay, I need to change. Paul is not telling them to change. He's telling them that when they allow God to grow them, they will change. They will change. And there's a big difference. You see, a lot of times what we do is we do it backwards. What we do is we say, we find ourselves here and we say, okay, I need to change so that I can grow, so that I can trust God more, so that I can obey. See, we do it opposite of what God says. And God is not saying you need to change. He's saying when you make the decision to obey me, it's like getting on an escalator that will take you somewhere to where you will find your life changing. You will find your attitude changing. It's like an airplane that you get on. Once you get on, you can't get off. It's like a roller coaster. Have you been on a roller coaster before, right? You can sit there all day and look at that roller coaster. I know some of you have been like that. You go to the amusement park this summer and they got this new roller coaster. And what you do is you stand out out front of that roller coaster. You're like, man, that's a big hill right there. Boy, how many loops that got? Three loops? Four loops? Oh, man, I don't know about that. It goes how, 120 miles an hour? Upside down the whole time? Hmm. You ever see that? Did you ever go in the music park? You see somebody debating whether or not they should go on there. You know, some 45-year-old guy. You know, you just want to tell him, bro, it's not a good idea, bro. You got a family to think about. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you got responsibilities, Right? But I'll tell you, here's what happens is a lot of times, with the, I'm not, listen, when, what we're talking about this, let me just say this, I, I just want to be clear because I want to understand what the Bible says here. There are two groups of people in this room right now. And this message is talking to just one of them. I'm not talking, Paul is not talking to the people who are at the, on, the, on the main level looking at the roller coaster deciding if they want to get on. He's talking about the people who have already waited in line, got in, buckled themselves in, and they're going up that hill. Click, 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 click. There's no turning back when you get to that point. When you're on that cart, you're going on the ride, whether you want to or not. This is what he's talking about. Let me take a moment and explain it even deeper. Understand that there's a lot of Christians over here who aren't sure if they want to obey God. They're not sure if they want to trust God. They're not sure if they want to grow. They're not sure if they want to change. We would call these people kind of casual Christians. We would call people like this, and, and nothing wrong with it. I'm not putting you down. I'm just trying to help you understand what he's teaching. What he's teaching is there's a lot of people who consume Christianity but are never changed by Christianity. They consume it. They like how it makes them feel. They like what it does. They like the youth group for their kids, and they like the kids' program. But to change? No, 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 no. I don't want to get on the roller coaster. I just kind of want to watch it go around. Right? And there's a lot of people in, this, in, in our world, the Christians, who just want to consume and consume and consume. This is not who Paul's talking about here. He's talking about the people who have already decided, you know what, by the grace of God, I'm going to do what I need to do. I'm going to obey God. And when God puts me in awkward position, I'm going to trust him. And when I, when, when I trust him, I'm going to grow. And when I grow, I'm going to change. This is who he's talking about, these people right here. He's talking about the people who have decided to trust God and now he wants to show them the changes that are going to happen in their life because they made a choice down here. 
And I just want to encourage you, if you're down here, the question you have to ask yourself is this. Are you sure you want to grow? Because when you start to grow, God will start to change you. It will happen. It's inevitable. It's, let me say it this way, it's subject to change. It's subject to change. This is what Paul is teaching here. So, here's the simple question that we have to ask ourselves this morning. What will change when I grow? Okay. I'm with you. I'm tracking. Now, if some of you that are over here, that like you haven't decided to like obey and follow and do this stuff, you pray for the ones that are over here, okay? Because I'm going to be talking to them, okay, about what's going to be happening in their life. And maybe for you, it might be like, yeah, I'm glad I'm on that side. I'm glad I'm not on that roller coaster getting flipped upside down. I'm just going to stay where I'm at. I don't know how God's going to speak to you. But the question of the address is this, okay, if change is a part of the Christian process, what will change when I grow? He says in verse number 14, the first thing that will change is this, you will respond to life differently. You will respond to life differently. Look at verse number 14. It says this, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Now, here's the thing that blows my mind is that sometimes you think, we, we kind of have this, like, uh, this excitement we build up, like, okay, I'm going to obey God, and then I'm going to trust him in the difficult times, and I'm going to grow in his grace, and then God's going to change me. God, what is it that you're going to change? Like, are you going like, to completely change my life and like, do something miraculous? And God says, yes, I'm going to keep you from complaining. And it's interesting that Paul says, hey, listen, God has worked in your life. He's grown you. Trust him. Man, rely upon him. Obey him. Why? Because you got to stop complaining. You see, he says, when you allow God to grow you, God will change you. And the change he will make is you will respond to life differently. And we see the significance of every action. It says in verse 14, it says, do all things without grumbling and complaining. You see, what God is trying to teach us is that everything should be done a certain way. Some of you, some of you type A control people, man, I just, I just said the greatest line you ever heard in the history of heritage right there. You're like, yes, I knew it. Yes, it should be done my way, <laughs> right? Everything should be done a certain way. He says, do all things. He doesn't say do some things. He says, do all things. What it shows us is the significance of every action. God is concerned with every single action in your life. Every single thing God wants to be a part of. You say, how do you know that? Well, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, it says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. God is not shy about saying, listen, I, I created you, I gave you a life, and I'm concerned about every area of your life, every little detail of your life, every single action that you make. There's nothing insignificant to me. How do we know that? God cares about every detail of your life. The Bible says in Luke chapter number 12 and verse number 7, it says, why even the hairs of your head are all numbered. God is so concerned about your life and the details of your life that he even gives your hairs numbers. I don't know which one this one is. This might be 72, hair number 55, hair number 36. Some of you, it's a little easier. It's getting easier over time. God's giving you grace to make it easier, right? Praise the Lord for that. But God says, listen, I'm so concerned about the details of your life that even the hairs of your head, I got numbers for all of them. I know exactly which ones are in order. I could line up the hairs of your head. And he says, do all things without murmuring and disputing. And we have to understand this, that God is concerned with the details of our lives. God is concerned with how you talk to your kids. I'm preaching to myself here a little bit. I was waiting for the echo to bounce off the wall and come back to me and hit me, right? God is, God is concerned with how you treat the barista when they get their order wrong. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. God, God, look, what is that? God is concerned with what's, what's on your phone. Do all things. You see, sometimes we, we live our Christian lives in this, this like utopian idea of like there's significance and there's insignificance. And what we do is we, com we compartmentalize the insignificant and we say, oh, God doesn't care about that. But he does care about this, right? 
God says, I care about it all. I care about the thought that just went through your mind right now. I care about your attitude. I care about your actions. I care about the way you drive. I care, I care about how, how you respond to people. I care about all of it. And Paul is teaching them that, listen, when you begin to grow and God begins to change you, then God begins to change not just one little part of you. God wants to change all of you. Every area matters. Do all without murmuring, or without grumbling or disputing. Why? We see the significance of every action, but I want you to see the response of every Christian. He says, do, do all things without grumbling or disputing. I put this statement down. Here's what he's saying in verse 14. If I summed up verse 14, he's saying this. A, a, a Christian should live without complaining in their mouth and doubt in their heart. That's what he's saying. Now, let me, let me give you this. Go, go back to that verse there, Larry, without grumbling or disputing. So what does it mean to, to grumble, right? Grumble, if you look it up, it literally means murmuring or secret displeasure. Secret displeasure. It's not like, it's not, it's like, this makes me laugh because I can think about this happening like in people's homes and stuff like this, you know, right, whatever, right? Like, it's like, uh, you know, when something happens in your relationships, in your home or at work or something like this, and you don't say something, but you do say something, but you just don't say it so everyone can hear it. You know what I'm talking about, right? Sure, no problem. We can get that project done by tomorrow. Sure, absolutely. Thanks for the notice. I appreciate that. And you walk away. You ever watch the movie Home Alone, right? With Marv and Harry, right? And uh, Harry and Marv. And the one Joe Pesci, he's like, Ressa, 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 Ressa. We do that sometimes in my house. Ressa, Ressa, Ressa. Right? He's saying, he's saying, listen, as a Christian, you can't live without, with murmuring and secret displeasure. God says, I, I, I'm changing you so that, so that it's not what you say on the outside, but it's how you think on the inside. And I want you not to have, live with secret displeasure. Some of you are secretly displeased with your marriage. Some of you are secretly displeased with your work. You're secretly displeased in your life. And some of you need to understand that God is calling us to not live that way. Disputing means a hesitation or doubt about the truth. And so God is saying to us, listen, if I'm going to change you, you're going to respond to life differently. You know who complains and who should uh, grumble and who should doubt are people who don't know Christ. But if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and God is changing you, then you should live differently. And this is how you know you're growing. You know how you know you're growing when that thing that you used to get upset about, you no longer get upset about. The thing didn't change, but your response to it changed. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. You see, so many times in our lives, we deal with situations, and we think I have to deal with it the way that everybody else deals with it. I should respond the way that everybody else deals with it. Listen, almost everybody will deal with the same situation, but Christians are called to respond differently in that situation. That's what he's saying. That when God is changing you, you will find yourself responding the way that God wants you to respond. Christians respond to life differently. Any situation, whatever it is, something happens to you, somebody messes up your order at Starbucks, right? Your response is, I can't believe this, you know, this incompetence. And you say, well, I would never say that. Well, not outwardly. Sorry, I forgot my mic. Secret displeasure. You say, I can't believe this. I can't believe what's going on. Go, go God says, no, 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 no. You, Christians don't respond that way. We respond to life differently. You ever see a, a Christian? I, I've seen it as a pastor. I've seen Christians diagnosed with something in their life. And I've seen them respond to faith. They've responded in joy. They've responded in peace. Why? Because Christians respond differently to life. See, this is what God's trying to teach you. God's saying, I'm not going to change life. I'm just going to change how you respond to it. And when you allow God to grow you, you will change the way you respond, the way you respond to life. We see, secondly, if God's going to change you, what, what will change when I grow? Number two is this. You will prioritize your spiritual identity. You'll prioritize your spiritual identity. 
And with the remainder of our time, I want to I want to focus in on verse 15. It says this: that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. So what happens is, is that when I uh, allow God to grow me, God's going to change. What's going to change when I when I grow? I'm going to respond to life differently, and then I'm going to prioritize my spiritual identity. Now, let me just say this before we jump into the verse, that the start of your spiritual identity begins when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. When I'm talking about a spiritual identity, that means I'm talking about someone who can say, yes, I am a Christian. And the way that you say that you're a Christian is not because you come to church or you give money or you're really religious or moral. The Bible is very clear that the way you become a Christian is simply by asking Jesus Christ to be your Savior. See, the Bible says, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for all have sinned. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everyone that is born, their first identity is a sinner. A sinner. That little cute baby that was just born, she is a sinner. Evil sinner, right? You say, oh, my cute little baby. Yes, that's what God says. Sinner. Everyone has an identity when they're born is a sinner. And then somewhere along the line, as they allow God to work in their life and God speaks to them and shows them the gospel, they get a different identity. They get a spiritual identity, a Christian. And that's where it begins when you accept Jesus Christ. Listen, if you've, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'm just telling you this. You don't have a spiritual identity. You're still in the original identity that you had when you were born. But the good news is that you can accept Jesus Christ today, and he will give you a spiritual identity. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But that's where it starts. Our spiritual identity starts when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. The Bible, the Bible says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. How many thank you for that this morning, that God's made you new? Come on now. We celebrate that in this place this morning. Hey, I'm a new creature. I have a new identity. I have a new purpose. I have a new direction. But it starts when we accept Christ. Now, there's a connection of your spiritual identity. Now, I'm going to take the time to explain this. We go verse by verse. If God says it, we're not going to skip it. And so we've got to dive deep in this. I could, like, surface it and say, hey, just like, man, just be a good Christian out there. But it's so much deeper. Because what he's talking about here, he's talking about the connection of your spiritual identity. He says that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish. That's what he's saying. You see, what he's, what he's making the connection is he's saying, do all things, follow me now, do all things without, without grumbling or disputing. That's verse 14. So that, verse 15, that you may be blameless and innocent, Children of God without blemish. So he is connecting our identity to the way we live. He's connecting, hey, this is who you are. So because this is who you are, this is how you need to live. You will live a certain way based upon how you identify yourself. Let me say it this way. The choices of your life reveal the identity of your heart. So that as you're living your life, what Paul is teaching, he's saying the reason why you need to not complain and grumble and have secret displeasure, the reason why you need to respond differently is not because it's the right thing to do, it's because that is what Christians do. And if you are a Christian and you identify as a Christian, you will live differently. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. There's a connection. So my actions, my choices of my life reveal the identity of my heart. That brings us to the last part of verse 15. And I want to talk to you about the selection of your spiritual identity. Why is this important? He gives us in the rest of verse 15. He says that you may, you may live blameless in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So let's put verse 15 all together. That you may be blameless, identity, and innocent, identity, children of God, identity, without blemish, identity. Because I am a Christian, I need to live 
out of that identity. Why? So that I can shine like a light in the world. What he is saying is this, is that when you live differently, when you live out of your spiritual identity, you're going to live differently than those who don't have a spiritual identity, which means you're going to stand out. Right? That's, that's what I'm trying to say. You get that? We following? All right. It gets even better. Because he goes on and he says, look, the thing is, is that God has called you to shine as a light in the world. Let me, let me give you an example if I can. I brought my little toy here today. All right. Good? Good, good. All right, here we go. All right. Got it there. Did I put it on right? Am I good? All right. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Here we go. All right. Okay. So what he's saying is this. When you have a spiritual identity, it's like you have a light attached to you. And, and when, you, when you live differently as a Christian, the Bible says that you shine like a light in the world. Right? Wherever you go, the light shines. Right? Wherever you go, whatever situation that you're in, the light shines. Okay? This is how we, what he's saying. He's saying, when you live out of your spiritual identity, it's like a light shining because you will be so different. Like, okay, and I'm, I'm, I'm just saying this. Let me give an example. It's like when you sit down at the restaurant and, like, the restaurant is full and you know that your family prays before the meal, right? And all of a sudden, you kind of look around and do one of these and you don't do one of these prayers. Lord, I'll pray the of Jesus, man, man. Right? You know what I'm talking about? Some of you done I've done that before, right? Lord, I'll pray the of Jesus, man, man. Okay. <laughs> man, I got a crick in my neck. Oh, man. Like when you like actually like say, all right, let's pray. And you know the waitress is about to come back with your refill and you know she's going to interrupt your prayer. You know, you've been there, right? And she was she's like, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, right? And you say, hey, when you, in that restaurant, you say, you say, hey, let's, let's pray together. Lord, I pray you bless the food. I thank you for your goodness and love. In Jesus' name, amen. And you look up and there's someone next to you going, okay, right? You feel that? You know what you just did? You shine the light. You shine the light. You shine the light. Right? Here's the problem, though. I have to do this. It'll blink bread. Don't let it scare you. That's how it does. Okay. Here's the problem, though. The problem is, is that we don't always live out of our spiritual identity. Because we can identify ourselves however we want to identify ourselves. And our actions will be out of the identity that we choose. You wake up tomorrow, you decide if you're going to live out of your spiritual identity or something else. All of us have identities. All of us have things that we live out of. Okay? For example, let me give you, for me, let, let's go through my identity. If you wait, Larry, put that, you have that picture of me up there? Okay, this is me. Hi, I'm Steve. All right? So I'm a millennial, barely, barely. 1982, just squeezed in under the wire there, barely, all right? Some of you looking at me, judging me, ain't no millennial, he's old. I'm a millennial, all right? I'm an old millennial, but I'm a millennial, all right? Okay? I'm black. Okay? There we go. <laughs> Pretty obvious, right? I'm from the Northeast, from Philly. You know, you know, people from Philly are, hey, come on, West Philadelphia, born and raised. <laughs> actually, I was from the suburbs. It just, you know, I tell people I'm from Philly, it sounds tougher. You know what I mean? I was actually born outside the, the city, in the suburbs, right? I'm a Christian. I'm a man. I'm a man. Hey, I'm a man. A man. Right? I had an absent father. Just my identity. All right? Now, here we go. What God is saying to you is this. Is that as a person, you can choose what identity that you live out of. A person that God is changing will prioritize their spiritual identity. You see, I could wake up tomorrow... And whatever situation that I'm looking at, whatever news situation comes on, news, I can decide how I'm going to respond based upon the identity that I want to pick. Mm -hmm. And my response to that situation may be out of the wrong identity. If I see something on the news and I say, you know what, I'll tell you what. I don't like the way that that happened. I don't like that, that, uh, that injustice over there. I'll tell you, because I'm, because I'm black, I'm going to respond out of that identity. 
I, I could say, hey, you know what? I'll tell you what, man. I, I, you know, uh, excuse me. I, you know, you got my order messed up, and, and, and I don't appreciate that. You know, and you better get it right. Oh, so you, yo, I'm sorry that you're offended. Hey, I'm from Philly. You know, you know how we are. You know how people from Philly are. You know what I mean? I'm from the Northeast, you know, so get over it, all right? You know? I could go home to my wife and say, hey, how come this isn't like this? And how come this is like this? You know, I'm the man of this house, and I'm a man. And as a man, I expect things. This is my home. I can respond out of all kinds of identities, and here is the problem. The problem is, is that we go around and live our lives, and we put Christianity on the list, and when we feel like responding out of that identity, then we pick it. But if being black is better, or being a Northeast is better, or being a man is better, or being a millennial is better, I'm going to form my opinion and my choices out of that identity, and I'm telling you, Paul is saying, don't do that. Because those that God is changing, those that God is growing, what will happen? Guess what's going to happen? When you grow, you'll start to respond in life out of your spiritual identity. And you'll say, wait a minute, what does God say? What does God tell us? What is the truth in God's word? You see, this is how it really should be. Go to the next slide, Larry. This is how it should be. Hi, I'm Steve. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. You see, the, the problem is this. Sometimes we think, well, I'm a man, I, I'm, a, I'm a black man who's a millennial from Philly, uh, and I had an absent father, and I just happen to be a Christian. Wrong order. And we have so many Christians living and making unwise choices in their life, not because they're bad people, but because they keep picking the wrong identity to live out of. And God is, God is, God is challenging you. And he's saying, before you decide to respond out of your ethnicity, and before you respond, decide to respond out of your location, and before you decide to respond because of what happened to you when you were a kid, listen, I gave you another identity. It's a spiritual identity. Listen, I'm not a millennial who's black, who's from the Northeast, who ha who's a man, who has an absent father. I am a Christian first. I am a Christian, and I'm going to stand proudly on the spiritual identity. And what God says is this, when I put my uh, spiritual identity first, guess what happens? The light goes on. And all of a sudden now, I'm responding, and people are going, what's wrong with that guy? Hey, you know what? He's a black man. Shouldn't he respond differently? Hey, he's a millennial. He shouldn't feel that way. He's a man. He shouldn't let that happen. Oh, he had an absent father. He shouldn't feel that way. And none of those identities are as important as my Christian identity. And people look around and they go, wait a minute. It doesn't add up. This is who they are. This is the color of their skin. This is where they're from. This is what happened to them. They shouldn't be this way. But you know why I am? You know why I can say that God has set me free? and he's given me a new path and he's given me purpose and now I can be a father to my kids. I don't have to worry about those things. It's because God gave me a new identity. And when you have a new identity, you can shine the light. You shine the light. You see, the moment you decide to respond because I had an absent father, you know what happens? the light goes out. When I decide to respond to life because of my ethnicity or because of my age, the light goes out. And God is calling us today. He's challenging us. You want to you grow? Then you're going to have to change. And when you change, God's going to do something impactful. All of a sudden, you're going to find yourself being a light. See, how do you know that? Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 16 simply says this. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You know, I grew up without a father, which means statistically... There's a lot of things in my life that should be different than what they are. But God has given me the opportunity to be a father. I'm going to be the best father I can be. Because I'm not going to live out of the identity or the thing that happened to me. And the greatest freedom in your life right now would be to release the identity that you're holding on to. And embrace the identity that God has given you. 
Because even though that story is hurtful, and even though that situation is tough, if you'll embrace your spiritual identity, you know what God will do? He'll take what happened to you, and he'll use it for his glory. I can't tell you the number of young men I've sat down with and talked to, and they've shared with me about their issues with their father. And you know, back when I was 10, 12, and 9, I didn't see it then. But God was doing something. He was working, and now I can be a light. Can I just encourage you? You say, what are you trying to say, Pastor Steve? I'm just trying to say that God has called us to something more. And when we decide we're going to obey, and we decide that we're going to trust God, and we decide that we're going to grow, guess what's going to happen? Larry, can you put that big slide up that says change on there, Larry, if you don't mind? What's going to happen is we're going to step into change. You see, what's gonna, what, what, what will change when I grow? You'll respond to life differently. And you'll begin to prioritize your spiritual identity. And you'll live out of that. And when you live out of that, you'll shine as a light in this dark, dark world. Can we pray together? Lord, we love you. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for your faithfulness and love. God, thank you that we can shine as a light in this world. Lord, I do pray for those in this room this morning who...